<laughs> What's up? How's it going? How's it going? Dude, it's going great, man. Good. Yeah, so. good. Happy and, Thursday. Oh, Almost yeah. Halloween. Dude, no joke. No joke. Like October already? It's cold up there. I mean, in Texas, <laughs> the weather is it's coming along, you know? Yeah. We're in West Texas. It's like 50s. And I'm loving it. Nice. So. Good. How's everything in NYC? Good. It's uh, getting cold here, too. I'm definitely fall weather. I went to uh, apple picking the other weekend. So, you know, got that fall, those fall activities going on. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, but yeah, no, happy to be here this morning for sure. Cool. Cool. I know you, you're super busy with all the expert stuff. So thank you for just joining still. And I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Helping me, help me out. So, yeah, no, it's always fun. It's always fun. Yeah. Yep. So I was saying, uh, this week I just like posted on Twitter cause we get a lot of comments or inquiries about, uh, mm-hmm. Hey, how do you build from Flutterflow like ground zero? I'm a beginner. What's going on? Like explain to me the platform, you skip over a bunch of stuff mm-hmm. and maybe I'm just responding to the haters, but, uh, you know, they're like, Oh, you, you skip over this and this and this. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you're right. So I wanted to try and just go over how to build a simple application, like a, uh, authentication right nice. maybe from maybe from a figma file so i have a figma file um i'm going to utilize the one from ffdc nice. basically so if i bring it up here i'll share it um and we'll just implement some of the screens and i'll try to explain everything like i was a beginner and if i miss something mm-hmm. please let me know like hey that that sucks so uh the goal is to obviously build an app with authentication that logs in, it gets maybe a uh, list view and details view of an element, whatever that element is. In this case, it'll be like Flutterflow classes possibly. Nice. Uh, and then let's see. Yeah, let me share that screen. Um, window, Figma. Okay. So something like this. Um, I'll, I'll share my screen. Something like this, you know, simple, create account, log in, hook up Firebase. And again, I'll use Firebase just because, uh, yeah, it's sort of integrated the best with Flutterflow and I haven't done super base. I haven't had much time. So thank you, Daniel, Kareem, Ketales, Catalis, maybe, Catalis, let's say. <laughs> Marcin, good to see y'all again. Um, so yeah, we want to just... We want to build this out, and this is a very typical flow, right? You you have something in Figma, you implement it in Flutterflow. Um, you can do the Figma to Flutterflow theme gen if you would like. Maybe we'll do that. Mm-hmm. That take that just takes it. I think it takes longer <laughs> than, yeah, it like takes longer for me to do that than just copy and paste uh, yeah. hex code. So nice. <clears throat> yeah. Awesome. No, this will be uh, this will be great dive into cool yeah and i think you know just i at the bare minimum i want to be able to point to this like when somebody says hey i'm a beginner i don't know where to go we'll Mm -hmm. just point to this live stream we'll just say go to this live stream boom so i'm going to be very so some of you guys like that are experienced um thank you for joining and this may be like boring Mm -hmm. to you or uh i don't know sometimes it's good to know the basics you know like In anything, in basketball, right? You you have to learn the fundamentals. Like, who cares if you can make seven out of ten three pointers? Like, if you don't know how to dribble, yeah, and you don't know how to utilize the screen, you will never get open. So it won't matter. Ooh. So this will be like fundamentals of Flutterflow, fundamentals Flutterflow one hundred and one, right. something like that. Cool. I'm going to share another screen now, and we will first. I'll create a project so you guys don't see all of my uh, Flutterflow and Flutterflow and Etc. from there. All right. So I uh, will very first thing we need to do, obviously, we are going to create a project. So we get sorry. Uh, we get that from just getting on the dashboard here and creating a new project. So we're gonna create a new project. We're gonna say FF Education whoop, Education 101. I'm going to create blank. 
All right, then we're going to get our project name. So we're just going to, we're going to keep that. We already created the project name. And for this package name, we'll just do Flutterflow Education. We'll set up Firebase because mm -hmm. we need that. So, well, and so just for a, a starting point too, if you've never built an app before, the package name, a lot of people get confused as to like what that is, right? Um, basically, when you're uploading the package uh, or specifying the application within the iOS uh, or, you know, the App Store or Google Play Store, you need yep. to utilize some sort of identifier. And um, that also stores the application within Firebase, right? So if you were to go to Firebase after we connect it, um, it will have that application ID. Andrew, do you typically use like a standard method to create that? Typically, you could just do, it's like, I've heard it's your domain reverse yeah pretty much yeah yeah exactly so here like flutterflow com i mean it could be flutter io.flutterflow.ff education yeah. um but yeah for the for now it's like this is probably best practice so cool. nice. uh yeah domain reversed and then project name essentially nice so and we're going to do the next step and and i don't know if this is actually live for everybody so uh this part oh it's coming and you're going to see how awesome, how freaking awesome this is, because this is going to make building a flutter flow so much easier for beginners. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, This simple thing. So, yeah, we'll just showcase it. And hopefully by the time we point people to this, they will get this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're just going to create a project. Flutter flow 101. We're going to uh, do NAM United States. And, and the region here, the region that you're selecting yeah try to select it in the area of which your users are going to be, right? Yeah. So if you're a US-based app developer, but you're building an app for people in Europe, right, that are going to be uh -huh. using it, probably set the, the database location to a European-based database. That way your, your app loads quicker. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, we, maybe we won't be able to do this. I don't know why the sign in with Google is not working. Mm -hmm. So we'll just, we will go to firebase and we'll set it up because that's that's sort of what oh, i'm going to share this tab but let me get to a place where i can Sorry, don't review firebase. okay uh yeah all right and then so we'll, we can we i'm like really breaking it down here because i guess the dude yeah is, that, that's the whole point. Know, like Firebase, people that are creating their first Flutterflow project might have no idea what Firebase is, right? That they have to go yeah. and like, wait, I thought I was building in Flutterflow and now I'm jumping into Firebase. What is Firebase? Yeah. Yeah. Firebase is a NoSQL database. Is That's where your information is being stored, right? So yeah. Flutterflow is a visual builder and you can connect it with other databases available, right? So Flutter, or Firebase, Superbase, uh, anything else you want to add there, Andrew? No, this is amazing, dude. Yeah, thank you for helping me fill in the gaps because that's the whole thing. You uh, did this like so quick, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm it's like, like oh, yeah, no, yeah, there's no is, question. But I'm like, oh, wait, this a is, yeah, fire, yeah, exactly. And I think this is where most people get hung up because mm -hmm. it's like, oh well, why do I have to leave Flutterflow? Like, I just want to build an app, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and and that whole create project flow that you saw basically brings all of this functionality into Flutterflow. So you don't have to leave Flutterflow, which is amazing when it's up and running. Um, but for now, it's not that hard. I mean, you go to you go to Firebase, you create a project, right? Yeah. Um, we have our projects up here. We're gonna go to project settings, okay? So go to project settings after you've created your um, Firebase. And the Firebase, just go to console.firebase.google.com. Um, or firebase.google.com, create an account, uh, and then you can create a project. So we're just going to copy this project ID here from the project settings. We're going to take it back to this one. Okay, set up Firebase. We're just going to copy or paste our Flutterflow Education 101 here. We're going to connect it. Oh, duh. I mean, come on. We do this so often, and yet we still fail. <laughs> The second thing you have to do here in order to connect Firebase is go to users and permissions. We're going to add a member here, Firebase at Flutterflow.io. We're just going to give it an editor role. We're going to add the member. 
All right, and then we have to go to advanced permission settings. And this in this advanced permission settings, we're going to give that user uh, some additional roles so that we can do stuff like connect and create collections within Firebase. We could push mm -hmm. we could do push notifications. We can deploy to the App Store. Um, we can do we can basically communicate with uh, Firebase from Flutterflow. So the first one is Cloud Functions Admin. Oh, and you might want to switch to that page. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, and again, this is all in the documentation. There's, you know, a YouTube tutorial. There's also detailed documentation. So, definitely check that out. Um, yep. It'll tell you exactly what buttons to click on and everything here. Yep. So, we're in this, uh, yeah, we're, we're in this admin panel, like additional resources. We're going to click the edit icon next to Firebase at flutterflow.io, do an add another role, and we're going to search. Cloud functions admin. All right, we get that. And then we need one more role, which is service account user. I just memorized these like a month ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always I always had to look them up. <laughs> um, all right, so now that we did those two things, we can come back to our Flutterflow project here. And we should be able to, before we didn't have access to Firebase, so now we can connect. It's probably good that we are failing like this, right? Because mm -hmm. these are probably failings that most users run into. Mm -hmm. So this is good. F boys, I hope you're not doing red flag like we are a red flag. It's like these are definitely green flag vibes. Here. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to auto, auto generate config files. And maybe, Will, if you want to talk about config files a little bit. Yeah, these are basic uh, files that are being created to actually connect. Firebase to your application here, right? You need some sort of uh, application configuration, including like uh, different keys and, and things to connect your Flutter application to the database. So that's what's being generated. Um, you can regenerate these configuration files at any point within the settings, but you really wouldn't be editing them for any reason. We just need them uh, to actually, again, connect the application when in production and testing. Yep. Yep, and so we connected them, we config, we, we generated our config files. Um, now we want to enable, and this is sort of a two-step process. So again, this is really great that we're doing this. So we're gonna enable authentication in Flutterflow um, and we're gonna create our user collection. So this will allow us to log into an app, right? Like connect to Firebase and log in. Um, this create user collection, you don't have to do this. You could create a generic one um, yourself, but we will basically just fill in the information needed for the social platform. So like display name, avatar, created time, um, email, phone, uh, password, which is secure in the authentication thing. So we're going to do that. And then we're also going to select our initial pages. Um, and we're going to do one more step in Firebase because we actually need to go back to Firebase and enable this in Firebase as well. Uh, but let's go ahead and select our entry pages. So our designs um, were following um, some of these templates. So this is gonna be beneficial. Nice. And I think it's this one right here. So we're gonna use this create account. We're gonna say create account page. So we'll do that. Perfect. And then our, our logged in page, um, we'll just create it blank for now because we will, yeah, we'll just say main home. Oh. Okay. Spelling errors are my own, so you don't have to experience those. Now we can start building. Cool. Perfect. All right. So we have our two pages here. And this create account page, obviously, we're going to need a login page as well, so that once users create accounts, they can actually log in. So let's go. And I did a command K. So how I got this menu if you just press Command K on, I think it's on Apple and Windows. Um, comment if I'm wrong. Command K, and I'll just search Add Page, and we're gonna do Login Account. Oh, obviously we need to log in. Okay, well we're gonna utilize this one. Page. Cool. Now we have our create account and login page. Mm -hmm. And down here, we have this ability, and I'll zoom in a little bit so it's a little easier, hopefully, to see. Let's see if I can 
make this. No, no, and do that away. There it is. Okay, so we have our two pages here. Create account, log in. Uh, these are responsive templates, so as you get bigger, they sort of respond as well, which is mm -hmm. a benefit to using our templates or some of our templates, and we're working on improving that. But pretty cool. Um, the way we sort of link these two screens, right? A log in and create account is we select. We're going to select this rich text here. Come up over here to the right panel where it says actions. It's this little cursor icon with a connector dot. So just click that. And then we can just, we have three options here. We can open the action flow editor. This allows you to fully build action flows. We don't necessarily need that here. So I'm going to close this. You could add conditional actions. So you'd say, you know, if user uh, is signing in in the morning, send them here. If they're signing in after 10 a.m., you know, sign here whatever you would like. We're just gonna add an action. And uh, of course I need to reload this screen. So while I'm doing that, I'm gonna go back to Firebase. Sometimes I, we still have that bug with templates, apologize. Mm -hmm. You just need to reload this screen and it should be good. But we're gonna come back to uh, Firebase. We're gonna go to our authentication panel over here on the left side panel. So as you, you open up the build tab, you can select authentication and you're just going to need to like turn these things on in Firebase. So authentication, we're going to set up, oh, sorry. We set up email password, right? We did that. You can add new providers like phone, anonymous, Google, Apple, um, Twitter even. I didn't know that. I don't know if we have Twitter in Flutterflow. I don't think so. I wonder if they still connect via the API, given the API costs. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> But we could definitely, you know, like we have the buttons for Google and Apple, so we'll mm -hmm. try to do that later. Uh, but for now, we just need email and password. So let's do that. And then let's go back to build. And there's a few more things we need to like turn on. So let's turn on this Firebase database or Firestore database. We're just going to create our database. And you can start in test mode or production mode. Um, this test mode, all it's going to do is it's going to set a request time. And so you're going to get an email in about 30 days that says like, hey, you can no longer create writes and reads to your database, right? Mm -hmm. So this helps protect against some stuff. Yeah. Um, Test mode just makes your database entirely open. So anyone yeah. can access the database via reading and writing. Whereas yep. production, you have to set specific rules in Flutterflow to allow access, right? So test mode is just great to, like Andrew said, just get moving and start testing things and building your app. Yep. And we'll just start in production um, for the heck of it. Um, so there's that, those two. Um, and then two other things that we want, or one other thing we, we want is storage. So we're going to be able to upload images to our application, right? So that when we create a, uh, a profile, we can maybe upload an avatar. And this storage will allow us to store assets like images, videos, audio, et cetera, in Firebase. So when we enable this, we'll do a few extra steps in Flutterflow as well. And basically all we're doing is deploying rules to this. So these, this is where everything's going to live. All of, when, a, when a user signs up, they're going to appear um, in this authentication tab, and they're also going to create a user collection here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those two things are tied in Firebase, but you can access the user collection, right, within Flutterflow. And so we'll showcase that. And then when you add, when you upload images, you'll upload images to this storage here. Okay, cool. Nice. So that's that. And those are the things we needed to set up in Firebase. So now we can come back here and we'll come to our a little rich text over here. We'll click, and as you can see, we have this action thing. We'll add an action now. We get this little action dialogue. Um, and we can search actions. We're just going to navigate and we want to navigate to this create account page. So let's do that. Uh, we will do, let's see, we'll do a fade transition. Um, the default transition type um, in all projects, I think, is from right to left. So just like a push. So you can do that. Um, you could basically on these types of pages, you either want to fade or a right left. Like if you navigate right to left on one, you navigate mm -hmm. left to right on the other, just to make it a little more like cognitively 
consistent nice. UX best practice. So we have that. We'll come over here to the sign in or to the create account page, and we will do the same for this one. We're going to add an action, um, and we don't even need to search. We can just log in account page. Perfect. Change that to fade. We want to allow back navigation. So in a mobile app, um, when you do like navigate right to left and you swipe from the left to the right, typically you'll navigate back to that other page. And so just saying like allow back navigation is going to provide that up op that opportunity. Nice. So now that we have these two things set up um, first, let's preview the app. So if you come up here to the right side of your builder, there's this little eye icon. We'll just click that. And it's going to open a new tab. So you can preview your application here um, and you can navigate to and fro. Oh, these are instants because we haven't set a duration on the, no, we haven't set a duration. I'm going to close. Sorry. I realized I wasn't showing that tab <laughs> as I said that. So we're going to set a duration here. We're going to do 200 seconds. Nice. And that's 200, 200 milliseconds. <laughs> yeah, 200 milliseconds. Sorry. So that's like a little, that's a quarter, a little less than a quarter of a second. Yeah. yeah. Yep. We'll share this tab. Nice. Yep. Cool. So now we have these two screens and we're able to navigate to and fro. All right. And as you can see, this uh, input is automatically, it's auto focused. And we'll dive into how to set that up as well. Oh, you know what? I should have switched back to that screen before I closed it. Hmm. Um, so now we can sort of edit or showcase what these text fields are. These are just widgets. You can create these widgets um, from going to the left. Oh, there you go. Yeah, this left side panel here, right? We have this build. So we have all of these icons here. These are default widgets within Flutterflow that you can just drag onto a screen. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll navigate to our home screen so we can showcase that. So we could drag an image here. Um, we could drag some text. We could drag a, oh, these are, these are very complex ones, page views and carousels mm -hmm. and expandables and wraps. So the basic thing in Flutterflow is a column stacks things vertically and a row stacks things horizontally. Nice. If you can, if you can learn that you will, your life will be a lot easier. Yeah. So I, when I learned that, I was like, Oh, now it makes sense. So um, yeah, that's, that's the thing. And if we come back to these account pages, we can see that we have a column here. And if we go over here to this widget tree, which is basically our, if you're a designer or you come from design software, uh, our widget tree is like our layers panel. So as you can see, we're nesting things here. We have a container here, which gives us our max width. So if we come down here, we have a max width on this container. So when we go to our tablet or desktop view, this container is not growing beyond that 430 pixels, right? Mm -hmm. And the way we're showing this gradient is responsively. So you can build responsive applications within Flutterflow and it's super easy. Nice. Um, you can build it out, right? These two things are in a row. We have our form container and our gradient. And then on mobile, over here on the right panel, we have these responsive toggles. So you can just turn this off um, on smaller tablets and phone screens. And so if we came down to like a Oh, let's see, something even smaller than that. Well, we'll see. I guess this is like a large phone. But mm -hmm. Yeah, there, that one's done. But a, a phone screen that disappears, same thing. Um, if we wanted this text to only show up on desktop, uh, we could hide it and then we could, you know, it would show up on desktop. So little things like that are help you sort of build, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and containers are the most advanced widget within Flutterflow. And by that, I mean, you could do the most styling to it. So you wouldn't use a column. Like you can't add a box shadow, a border, or a background to a column. Like yeah. The column is just for layout. A container allows you to uh, 
stylize all sorts of things. And we'll showcase that when we build the home screen. Nice. Um, but if we wanted like a border radius, a border, a fill color, a drop shadow on this card, we could do that all with a container. So think about that as like a frame in Figma, if you're coming from Figma. So, all right, so we have this. Um, let's go ahead and, well, let's do the second thing, which is what I would do in any application. Like this application looks decent as is, but it's not in accordance with our uh, brand guidelines set out in our Figma file. So the next thing we'll do is we'll actually like these. Um, yeah, this font is like Lexin probably. So let's go over here to this theme setting. And here we have our design system. And this is where we set up our breakpoints. Here it is. We're going to change this. We're going to do 1270. And we're going to do 991 on our breakpoints. And this just provides a little more natural uh, desktop size. So a small desktop is around 1270. And then now tablets are so huge. Like they go beyond <laughs> 1270, you know. Um, but 991 is a little more congruent with uh, tablet landscape and tablet vertical. So now if we go back like and showcase that 834 one, it'll, it'll hide on this little tablet. Um, we also have like scroll bar theme, pull to refresh. These are like really cool nuanced design elements that you can mm -hmm. implement into your application. Um, over here we have colors. And as you can see, we are like, we just set out these colors sort of as a base theme for your application. Okay. We set them out in a very specific way and the way they're laid out is uh, in accordance with all of our templates and uh, components or cards, yeah, elements that we create from a Flutterflow team. So all those template trains you saw, they're based off of this theme. And the way the theme is set up is three primary colors with three um, opacitated versions of those uh, primary colors. Mm -hmm. So this is like, this is this uh, orange at 30%. Same thing here, same thing here, like nice. primary color, 30%. Um, then you get into the alternate. The alternate color is a divider color within your application. You don't have to set up your theme like this. This is just how our, our templates are set up. So when you drag a card in or you utilize a template screen with my theme, uh, this is how they're set up. So these, this alternate color is always gonna be like a border color um, or a line color that divides list view items. Um, this accent color is an overlay. So it's typically like a, a background. It's basically our secondary background color at 70% opacity. Then we have primary text and secondary text, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, primary background and secondary background. So this primary background is typically our page background. The secondary background could be our surface right area. So like I have it as white in most of, most of the themes. Um, any card or material that lays on top of the primary background um, would be this color to provide some differentiation. So, and then we have semantic colors as well. Success error warning. Uh, this info button is an always white. So as you can see, we, we automatically create light mode and dark mode. You don't have to do that. You can toggle dark mode off if you would like. Um, you can also explore project theme colors if you would like. And all I did was come up here to the explore project colors. Over here, we have edit or explore. You can edit your color scheme here and see the changes in real time. And you can do light and dark mode there. Um, or you could explore colors and we could see, oh no, do we not use my theme with this page? Oh, we did. Did we not do it with this one? Oh, we didn't do it with this one. All right, give me one second. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just to make a new one. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna just delete this page and make a new one. That's terrible. Ah, delete page. Boom. Add. Create blank. No, we want this. See, we always use my theme. Create account. Okay, there it is. Nice. Now it's hooked up with this light and dark mode. Cool. 
So let's get back to that. Yep, these are all, like I said, explore colors. You can mm -hmm. come up here and you can explore different theme colors here. If you're a developer or if you don't have brand guidelines, you know, this is sort of a cool and fun way to just explore. Mm -hmm. uh, you can view different pages to see those primary colors. Nice. So this is something I love um, and I utilize. I, lo I love these little themes. So we'll go back to this. We'll, we'll do this purple tones one because it's close to um, our actual application. So we'll do that. The thing that I find myself doing uh, a lot actually is when I first start building a project and I jump right into it, I forget that the light and dark mode is set by default to on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'll go in, I'll start building, I'll start like selecting colors or maybe there's times where like, I don't take the time to go and create a theme color. So I just select a exact hex code. And then when I load the project for the first time in test mode, it'll look completely different than like what I thought it was going to look like because I yep. only designed it in a certain light or dark mode. So if that's something you run into where you try to preview the app and you're like, wait a minute, the app colors look completely different than I was designing. It's because most likely you're either in a light or dark mode toggle and you didn't design for one or the other. And you can always yep. turn it off if you want, just by like toggling off that yep. dark mode. Too. Yep. And if you, um, if you keep this structure within your application, then you won't have that problem because everything will sort of be boom. It'll automatically adapt yep. to this uh, light dark mode theme. Uh, Daniel, that's a great question. I like this. Um, sorry. He, Daniel is, He's always, he always joins these live streams or typically does. It'd be amazing if we were to select a component and see where or what pages it's used on. We'll try to get to components at some point. I don't know if we're going to do it in this live stream, but I agree with you, Daniel, 100%. Uh, we are working on something that will solve some of this issue for you. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So let's do that. We have colors here, typography here, right? You can set up all of your type. And I've said it before. I'll say it again just because this is, we want this live stream to be the source of truth for beginners. So the way this is set up, these are material design uh, style names. So we just, that's how we present it in Flutterflow. Um, you can maybe match your typography because you probably don't follow that um, that structure. You just match your type, typographic styles to these and that would be very beneficial. Um, the way we have set this up uh, is body large down here, um, these, and we'll do like medium here. These three elements are my three sizes for body type typography, right? So like typically 12, 14, 16 are standard sizes I use in mobile applications. Um, and same thing with these labels. These labels are my, are the same size, but different color. So they're the secondary text. So Typically, our secondary text is a gray to sort of contrast primary and secondary text. Um, then these title, title small and medium are the info button, right? They're, they're going to be my button text. So, and again, you can utilize title large if you want to. I just, I typically have two button size, two sizes of text within buttons. So I utilize these and every time I create a button, I'll set it to title small or title medium. Um, and then these are just your headers. So from headline to display, these are all your header fonts. And again, you can change them. You can adapt them. Um, if you wanted one to be, you know, 40, whoo, not 340, 40, and maybe 48, which is a little more normal, you could. Um, and then you can utilize these in your uh, projects. And as you can see over here, the font families, we provide almost all Google fonts. Um, we utilize a package and so it's not always updated, but it, we try to update it periodically. Um, but these are both Google font families and we have one layer of extraction above this. So instead of just selecting font families for all 16 styles, you can select a secondary font family and a primary font family and then set your text styles to that primary or secondary font family. This is a huge time saver. And I, I love it. So then we have theme widgets. Um, we won't talk about that in this project because we don't need to. I mean, yeah, I love theme widgets, big fan of them. 
Um, they allow you to sort of have that component style um, styling and, and change out, change, changeability. So super cool. So as you can see, we come back to our authentication page and we have these elements on here. We have some spacing. As you select an element, you see this green underneath. That green underneath is the padding. So on the right side panel, whatever element you select, you'll see padding here. You'll see alignment. Um, you won't typically need to worry about alignment on most things, um, but a, a common uh, construct would be something like column. If you select a column, you have the ability to select where things are aligned in accordance with that column. Um, like center, right, you know, span across, um, or start. And so if this one's on start, I have this little element down here that I don't want to start at the column. I want to uh, have it center aligned. So if you click that, oh, as I zoomed in, I lost track of it. If you click that and just, you know, you can align it here. So you can override the, that parent alignment of an, of an object. So, and that's within columns and rows typically, sometimes in stacks, if stacks are expanded or have a set width height. Um, and we'll maybe talk about that. Okay, any questions? Are we doing a decent job? I know most of you guys are not beginners. So, uh, mind elaborating a bit on XYZ? So, uh, I just, XYZ at Sonic had a question, but I was a bit confused uh, oh, okay, okay. for a specific workflow or a specific dashboard. Um, yeah. I'm trying to understand the question a bit more so we can answer gotcha. it. Yeah. I thought you meant like layers, like, you know, oh. like XYZ, <laughs> like placement on a screen. I was talking about alignment. So I was like, oh, maybe, <laughs> yeah, like we'll have floating things. Um, also, another, another, another common thing in Flutterflow is as you're building, um, you'll get errors, right? Because like maybe you you'll have an action that doesn't have a destination. You'll have a color that is mm -hmm. isn't in use, um, things like that. So you can just click this little icon up here, and you can easily see the error, nice. right? And it'll take you to that. So right now we deleted that screen that we were using, um, so we have to actually re-navigate to that screen. Mm -hmm. um, same thing here. We don't have an action, so I think we'll need to reload that and set it. And then we also need to set the initial screen. Like when we first, when we first created this project, yeah. we set the initial screen to this account that we deleted. So, all right, 200 fade. We'll go over to this settings icon here. And as you said, as, as I said, like in the app details, we have this entry page that is no longer selected because we deleted that page to replace it. So we'll just select that again. And here you can actually uh, set up or override your default transition. As we were saying earlier, mm -hmm. transition from right to left. Um, that's the default. So you can do this. If you're doing a web app, you can make pages require authentication by default. So this is another thing why people don't do like <laughs> these 101 <laughs> because it's like dude there's so much like man we could cover yeah, everything like, yeah. we could cover everything yeah um we cover we could spend an hour just covering the platform you yeah know? yeah um but we want to actually build stuff and that's what we do here on this so my goal is to just help you guys or help any beginner get right. started in connecting firebase and stuff so uh, this app assets we could upload a splash screen um we already have like some images from our team, but you could just upload it from your computer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to do this little guy for the heck of it because um, it looks good. And this is what will show up on your dashboard when right. you see the project. So um, you can also turn on a nav bar and an app bar. So when we create mobile screens, um, we could automatically create a um, app bar, which is just that top bar. And so you can stylize what that default style looks like here. Uh, it defaults to primary hmm. and like two elevations. So I'll just change that. Personalmente, I like uh, a, a white background or even our primary background color and then some primary text on these guys here. So to stay true, we'll do um, our primary background here. So 
Um, all right, so we have this. And then we can also, if we come back to our home screen, on this screen, um, in our design, we actually have like a map view in the back. Uh, and we don't really utilize this element here. Um, so we're going to remove that app bar. And we're going to drag in. So we can come back over here to this build. And we can search for our widgets. We're just going to search for, first, we're going to search for a stack. Okay. So this stack is going to be here. This stack allows you to free flow elements. So it behaves more like a design tool. Um, I don't use utilize them very often mm -hmm. because I like the structure that columns and rows give us. So when I utilize a stack, it's basically just to layer one element behind and then a few elements in front. Um, and the, what we're going to lay behind is this map view. So we're going to get a bunch of errors here because um, we're going to drag a map view in and we have to connect to Google and do all that stuff. So mm -hmm. maybe for the sake of this, we have a whole tutorial or we have a whole live stream on setting up Google Maps and doing this. So for the sake of this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a list view um, with tabs for the home screen. That's what we're going to do. Okay. So I think this... This stack is cool. You could basically layer anything on top of here that you wanted to. Um, it'd be really fun. But let's go ahead and do a home screen. We'll do page title. Yeah, we want we want our page title to be, and I'm selecting this text element from the app bar. So selected it in the widget tree, right? It gives me the access to edit all the properties on the right over here. And I'm just gonna say find a uh, tutor. Okay. Now we do want, and I'm I'm bringing up this element panel. I just I pressed Command F. So when you have a widget tree open, or when you're basically off of this top build thing, and you press Command F, it brings up this element panel where you can just drag and drop things onto the canvas very easily here. So I'm going to drag some text here. And then I'm going to drag a tab bar here. This tab bar is one of my favorite elements to use, I think. Um, it provides a lot of like common functionality within applications. So I'm going to remove that. I'm going to select this column. And as I said, columns allow you to stack vertically. So as you see, this text element here uh, and tab view are stacked upon one another. We want this text element to float to the left. Um, by default, columns. Uh, align everything in the middle. So we'll just do cross, al cross axis alignment to the left. Um, and then we can select this text. We can update it. Here we get access to all of our text styles here, which is cool. We're going to do a label medium. And we're going to add a little bit of padding on the left here. We're going to do 16, which is a very common uh, UI practice. Okay. And then we're going to say, uh, review the listings below for available tutors. OK. We're going off of, if you're just joining, we're sort of going off of a design in Figma um, that I showcased earlier. And yeah, that's what we're doing. So we have this tab bar. We can edit the tab names by just clicking in here and editing in the right. I'm going to say all. We're going to say favorite, and this one I'm going to say highly rated. OK. And if we select this tab bar, we can actually change the style of these tabs if we wanted to. So here we're able, we're able to select the selected color and unselected color of these elements. We can also change the unselected label style here. So if I wanted the selected to be bold and the unselected to be medium, I could do that. So I have done it there. We could also change the tab bar style. This is one of my favorite things. You have the indicator, which is just the line underneath. You have a button, which is like, for me, I love it. I think it's really cool. Um, it just provides like that little section behind it. 
and you can add padding to these as well. And then last but not least, we have this toggle button. So it provides sort of that segment control that you see in iOS. So you have that. Um, we also have the, if as you can see, like this one has very little padding on the left and right. So we could, we'll go back to this button style and we can change uh, button padding up here or label padding. And we'll do 12 pixels on the right and 12 pixels on the left here. And as you can see, it's still overflowing. And so the last thing we can do is we can make this tab bar scrollable. And that will just collapse these little guys down into a proper manner. Same thing if we had, um, let's go back to our tab bar style. We could do an indicator. And we could, instead of center aligning these, we could left align them here. So again, like I said, there's a lot of functionality and capabilities in this tab bar, and I really enjoy it. So we can even increase this label padding. There you go. And for the sake of this, we're going to do our indicator, um, and we're not going to make it scrollable so that it's sort of all the way across. What we'll do is we'll make it smaller. So we will do our label large and label large for these guys. And then we'll just make our selected one bold. That will match the design. And I think our design has a white app bar. So we're going to do secondary background here and secondary background on the page. And then we want a gray background for this content area. So I'm going to Again, tap Command F, tapping Command F, and I'm going to drag a container in here. This container is going to take up the entire space because it doesn't have a column or row. So it's just going to take up the entire space here. Then I can adjust this to our secondary color here. And we want to remove this space up here. So if we select this tab bar, um, on this tab bar margin, we'll just remove that space so that the line indicator is right above um, our content area here and we'll do like four or two. Okay, cool. We'll also remove this tap bar margin. So it's all the way across. Okay. Um, all right. So this is now a home page. We have three different views here and what we want is a list view because Eventually, we're going to create a backend query on this uh, design. So we're going to do a list view here, um, which allows us to optimize our backend queries. If we do it in a column, it'll load everything, and there's less functionality, and it's not best practice. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll do that. And then I'll show off another one of my favorite features in Flutterflow, which if you're not utilizing this, you're missing out on 180 uh, Elements that have been designed by myself and the team at Flutterflow, the design team at Flutterflow. We'll just say the design team at Flutterflow. Those who know, know. Um, we're going to search for a card here. So we're going to say like user. And we get all of these options that come up that are just pre-designed elements that adapt to our theme. So my element has something similar to this in Figma. So I'm just going to drag that in here and we can adjust this. As you can see, it automatically adapts to light and dark mode, which mm -hmm. is sick. Dude, this annoys me so much with other no-code tools like Framer and Webflow, which is what I, I utilize those for like website building. And all their templates are just default styling. Mm. That's it. Every time you drag something in, it's just like default styling. Yeah. You have to like adjust it to your theme. And man, it's annoying. Interesting. Um, yeah. So now we can, we're going to stylize this container. As we said, it's one of the most powerful elements within Flutterflow. So let's go ahead and select that container and we will add some padding to it. So 12 pixels. We're going to add a border radius of eight and we'll do a border color of this alternate one width. And we're going to add a box shadow. You can also add an elevation. I hate the elevation defaults. 
So we're going to do a drop shadow. Um, and that provides us a little card background. And we have three templates here. Eventually, we'll have like the ability to create templates yourself. Um, so you can have like template styles with your drop shadows and stuff. But for now, that's that. That's cool. Um, all right, we're getting to a place where we have 10 minutes left and we haven't even hooked up authentication and tested it. So I'm going to do test mode in the upper right hand corner. We get this uh, little lightning thing and that is test mode. So you can run your application quickly. It's called hot reload for non-developers. If you are a developer, you know that, um, but it's a hot reload. So you can actually test your app live within the browser. So amazing. If you're not a developer, you would have had to, again, like download Xcode or Android Studio, set up a dev environment, set up GitHub and VS Code and all this stuff. Like nobody wants to do that. Um, unless you're a developer, then you probably love it. Um, I would not like to do that. So that's what I'm saying. Cool. All right. So we have that test mode. Um, if we come back to our create account, we will select this button here. And we have an action hooked up already, which is sick. So we already have this create account button hooked up. Um, yeah, which allows us to sort of create an email and our password. So what we're going to do is when this happens, we're going to navigate, automatically navigate to that homepage. So what I would like to do here is uh, create a profile page so that you can see yourself, you know, so that we can validate that we've logged in. And all we're going to do is, again, we're going to create add page. We have a bunch of settings, profile pages here. Um, again, I'm not going to ever design a profile page again because I'm just going to utilize these. Nice. So you do you. Um, I'm going to use my theme on this and call this profile or mm. main profile. This is a good uh, off question, actually. Yeah. I want to bring up. So this person said, this is a big comment, so I might fill the screen. Uh, in yeah. my recent project, I tried to use Google login, but when I when the user logs in, it automatically creates the user in Firebase, which I don't want. I want to allow the user to log in if there's an account with that email. So that can be a little tricky. I think there's a toggle either in yeah. Firebase or it, Flutterflow. In Flutterflow. Um, right, where you can toggle on if user doesn't have an account, then create it. Just note that I believe if they've already logged in with an email off and then they try to use that same email with Google, it'll treat that as if the user is like already created an account and just attach the Google off to that email if it's the same email. So uh, you should be able to toggle that off ideally in Flutterflow. Yep. Yeah, you can toggle it off. I'll I'll showcase that in just a second. I'm gonna do no rush. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just do this light dark mode switch. I'm gonna center align it. Oh, and add some padding here. My computer's going a little slow now. I think it's like realizing. Okay. <laughs> um, two things we want to do here. We want to turn on this navigation bar. So show on nav bar here. And we have this nav bar is currently off in app settings. So we'll go turn that on. Well, let's do that one. And then let's set it on the main screen as well. We're going to show on nav bar. Come over here to settings. And we're just, we'll just toggle that on. And that's automatically going to give us our home screen and our profile screen. Um, and you can change the style of this. Right now, we just have it as white. Um, but you could change it to your primary background if you wanted to. Nice. Right? So like. This guy, and then it would change with the design of the app. So there you go. All right, so we're going to get to this screen, and we're going to navigate to our profile screen from it. And all I want to do right now is, we, yeah, I'm just going to set this email to the email of the authenticated user, which is sick, by the way. This is very easy. We already have this data hub, so users. Right. This is where you create your collections. So when we log in, we will have email, display name, photo URL. Um, you can, again, we've, we've done this before. We did this last live stream, actually. We set up a 
create profile screen after you logged in and set all of these things. So go back and watch that if you'd like. Um, but what, what, what we'll do is we'll just access this email. Nice. And this is basics of app building, right? Like you have a, an interface, a front end, where you're building out certain things like a page or a design, and then you need to feed data into that design. So that data is going to come from your database. It's not going to come from, you know, static stuff. Like in design, you have to design out all these screens and everything would be static. Here, we're going to just upload or showcase dynamic data to users. So here, anytime you see this orange icon, that means set for variable. So you can just click that. And we have this authenticated user collection here. This is a source. You will always have access to this. Um, if you utilize auth from another source like Superbase or uh, API, just uh, something's coming, um, then yeah, you'll, you'll also have this. But if you utilize uh, auth through a different API like Xano or something and you have it in App State, you'll have to access it through App State, but we won't get into that. So we'll just do email here. Um, we could also do a name here if you wanted to, right? Authenticated user, display ID. And we'll set a default value because we won't have one. Uh, we'll say Chef Norris, obviously, because we're building Chef Norris style UIs. Okay, cool. So in 57 minutes, um, and hopefully try to explain things in a V0 or very basic way for new users, I'm, I'm hoping so, please. Let us know. I know I'll, I'll be letting know in the comments. Um, but yeah, we have this great account. We have a main profile screen, an account screen, or a login screen, and then a home, home screen. So let's go to our test mode. Um, it's still, still running, still loading. So any questions that any first timers that are on this live stream, like do you guys have questions about or do you want to know how to maybe set up a collection? Let's go ahead and do that because that's a very basic thing that sometimes is challenging. So when you create um, collections, all you do is do this little button here, add a new collection. We're going to call this one tutors. And you can generate with AI, which is my favorite thing to do. So we're going to say a collection that contains a user ref reference, name, description, uh, category, list of strings for uh, subjects, and uh, location. We'll see if this works. All right. Perfect. I did it. We have our course, and we have subjects. Um, and this is going to be a sub collection of strings, not necessarily what I wanted, but I guess it works. Um, we have a location, which is a lot long. We have a category, which is a string. String is just any type of character as opposed to like integer or double, which are specific number based mm -hmm. um, data types. We have the doc reference, which is users. We have a name and description. This is perfect. I'm just going to add it in here. Um, yeah, we'll just add it in. There's an easier way to do this. We don't need this subject. Really, we could just do a list of strings here, hmm. but this works. Nice. Um, oh, we also need, no, no, we'll, we'll do this. Now on this screen, if we come back here, right, this is find a tutor. So obviously we want a list of tutors here. And what we'll do is select the list view, come over here to this database icon, which is a backend query. And we will just do add back in query, query collection, right? Because we're gonna we're gonna basically uh, access the database and try to get data from the database. So we're gonna do users. Oh no, sorry, we're gonna do tutors because that's what we want. We could add filters um, if we wanted to define this by subjects, right? Mm -hmm. And we could have choice chip somewhere. We just wanted math. We just wanted uh, UI design or development stuff. Um, yeah, you can do that. Or you could order by, so you could do like distance, right? If we have this location, 
and we had access to your location. We could filter by that by closest or furthest. Um, we won't do any of these. And then these backend queries, we have a single time query, which is going to definitely work for this because we, we are not trying to get real time data, um, which is like, a single time will be like, once you're, you're on this screen, we won't update this backend query. We won't constantly ping the database. It'll just be here, mm -hmm. be present. We don't need this to be real time. Whereas in like a social app where you maybe have like chat messages or something, you do want that to be real time. Um, so we'll and do that. that. Battery as well, uh, the single time, right? Because you yep. just query the data and it's, it's loaded and, and done. Yep, yep. So, so we got that. Um, and then we automatically generate these children here when you do a backend query. So what you can do is you can change the design of the top one and it'll edit the design of the of everything else. And so what I wanna do is I wanna remove the top and bottom padding because I wanna set that from the list view. So we'll just remove all of that, Oop, delete. As you see, the padding went away. And what we'll do is we'll say item spacing 12. We're selecting the list view here and we get this list view properties. We're gonna do item spacing 12, start spacing 12, and end spacing 44. Nice. That's just, yeah, that's what I like to do. And now, um, right now we don't have any of this data hooked up to the database. We have a list view of tutors, but nothing's dynamic. So let's go ahead and, okay, cool. Um, select our image. One thing we need to do is we need to query the reference to the user, which we did this last week as well. Um, all this does is if we come up over here, um, actually we'll, we'll query it on this row. What we're gonna do is we're going to query or get a document from reference. So this allows us to access this user document. Um, and we have, we're gonna select, so yeah, Essentially, we have a reference. Since this is a NoSQL uh, database, right? We have tables that are not aligned to one another. But what you can do is you can basically point to different uh, tables, right? Or, or collections within your database. So in tutors, we are pointing to the user document or the user uh, collection. And so what we want to do is we want to query or reference let's yeah let's use proper terminology we want to reference that document that user document that we're pointing to so document from reference collection users and then within our tutors document which we're getting from this list we want to come over here and do author which is the user ref so we just want that again single time query and what this does is it gives us access to all of the fields within that user document so now we, when we set from variable, we have this user document as well. We could set a photo URL, set up caching. Again, this is like, we could spend 10 minutes on just image, uh, yeah, how to stylize images and stuff. But let's go ahead and set up this text and we will do our display name here, which will be empty for now. So we're gonna set a default value so the, the list doesn't break. I'm just gonna do two lines or I guess we could do Chuck Norris again. Chuck Norris. Okay. We'll do an email here. We should always get the email, but best practice, let's leave a default value. And we don't need that. Cool. Um, our test mode is up and running, so let's go ahead and toggle over to that screen. And we'll just share this. So as you can see, this is test. So before we were navigating between two screens on preview mode, which is just like a, it's like a prototyping screen, you know, just like if you're in Figma and you played a prototype, like that's all it is. It's just connect, connecting screens, no live data. Now we're in test mode and test mode allows us to actually interact with our database. So we can navigate to and fro from these screens. We can select a uh, email. We could do like test at test com and do an email like test123, test123, and we can create an account. All right, so of course we get an error because, and I did this on purpose, you know, on purpose, because you need to deploy your rules. 
And that's a common error that you're going to face, right? So if you come over here, come back to the builder, okay? Come to this database icon here and up here, go to settings. And in settings, we have these rules and we actually need to deploy these rules um, and make the user collection readable to everyone. That's what we need because you're gonna be able to see different users within the application. So let's go ahead and deploy these rules, okay? And and like, uh, just like Will had said earlier, like um, setting up in production mode means we have to have these rules so that we can limit, you know, access to your database. And so that's what these are. And I may not explain that in the best proper, proper technical terms. I'm a designer, so Will's actually a lot better at explaining that stuff than I am. Um, but we have to deploy those rules mm -hmm. so that we can actually create and authenticate with our users. So, um, yeah, we're going to have to go back to our screen now here. And what we're going to do is we've probably created an authentication within Firebase, but we haven't created the user document. So if I try to log in with this again, it'll, it'll give me an error. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, I think that's going to be the case. Yeah. So if we come over to Firebase, this is my Firebase application. See, we have this identifier, right? But we have no, and this is our authentication. We see our user here, but we have no user document because we didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't deploy those rules. So again, common use case. Hmm. Um, this is probably a, an error that a lot of people face. So what we'll do is we'll come back here. We'll try a different user. So instead of test at test.com, we'll say uh, test at flutterflow.io. Nice. And then we'll create an account. And then boom, we automatically get navigated over here. But we don't see our bottom navigation bar because we started this test mode before those changes were made. So we have, you know, now we have a bottom bottom nav bar. We have a dynamic list here. Um, and what we can do, oh, dude, we're already over. OK, we're just going to instant reload. And we're going to see those changes. And then we'll just cut the cut the stream. We're just we're done. We're done. <laughs> I don't want to keep you all, but hopefully this was uh, beneficial. Hope, I mean, I know for a lot of our like experienced builders, like obviously you know this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I hope for beginners, this is a good, a, it's not going to be perfect. I know I'm not a perfect instructor, especially with something so complex, but we did accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. Okay. We logged in, we connected a database. We have this tab view, which is sick. We have this profile. We get our test at flutterflow.io. Right, um, we get light dark mode. I mean, pretty cool. <laughs> and hopefully, we went through and explained stuff. Yeah, hopefully so. So if you have people asking you, give me the basics of Flutter Flow. Send them to this video, and then we can get feedback. And you know, eventually, maybe I'll create a boot camp. But who knows? Nice. What? No. All right. Sick. Well, dude, thank you for joining. We had a, a good amount of viewers. This is awesome. I mean, yeah, and some good questions too. Um, I was managing the chat. Like a, a more technical perspective, and, and others a little different. Yeah. But, uh, have you experienced that? Robo Duck was talking about some sort of tap and drag issue in his web app, and I was saying you don't have to like click and drag. You should just be able to scroll. And he said, "Well, he has both. If you scroll up, I'll, I'll actually read it. It was kind of an interesting." Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, normal scrolling works, but if you hold the mouse button anywhere on the page and drag up, the screen goes down. Like if it was an app on your phone. Well, yeah. a web app, just so you know, in Flutter, uh, it's an iframe. So maybe yep. you're like dragging the iframe, but I doubt that would be what's occurring. So I, to be honest, I don't know. I haven't experienced this. I haven't heard of yeah. any users talking about this. I'm probably, I'm sure it's like something that we would understand if we saw it visually. It's just a communication like barrier between yeah, it and and yeah, understand. Yeah, go ahead and tweet at Will uh, with like a an example of yeah, it if for you sure. can. Uh, Marlon, I'm so glad, dude. I'm glad that this this helped. Sure. Um, let's see. I um, we have users here. Sorry, I'm on an app. 
-hmm. that we have previously built. I'll share this tab. Sorry, I knew, I know we said we were going to be done, but <laughs> um, it's probably with like I'm tapping and dragging this. But I'm not moving the page. It could be like maybe if we maybe, but this is already scrollable. Like That's I can what scroll. I was trying to figure out. Like go over to the menu. Maybe is the menu bar scrollable? No, it's not. And if I okay. tap and drag, it doesn't do anything. Sure. So, um, but. We do have this awesome expandable menu. So when, once we... This is a big question. Big yeah. question here. Can this be used in a Windows environment? Big news from a Flutter perspective. This is massive news. Firebase updated their packages uh, yesterday or the day before, actually, to now support Windows. We're still waiting on some other packages like Firebase Storage. I think there's a little bit of a delay um, but some of the packages obviously that are needed for those core features have been updated so ideally fingers crossed uh, maybe a few more things get updated in the flutter pub dev yep. realm and we'll be able to potentially have a flutter flow windows application too um, dude so pretty exciting that's, that's on huge the dependency right that's yeah. the issue yeah that's huge that is so huge. So, nice. Kitalis, well, we'll we'll try to do some more of the. I mean, we do this, but we don't do it as basic. Um, yep. But look, we'll, we'll see where where it where it lies, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, I do want to. I want more and more people to join, you know, and I want more and more people to be really good at Flutterflow. So that's why we do this live stream. Agreed. Um, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for joining. Appreciate Hope it. Hope you guys have a great rest of your your week. We will so. be back next week. Yes. Thanks to all the regulars for joining. Thanks for the new ones, yep. newbies. Um, and yeah, y'all have a good one.